Chris Hedges, Pulitzer Prize winner, former head of the Middle East Bureau of the New York Times, uh, edged out over the Iraq war, is a very considerable expert on the Middle East. And we're very lucky that he's joined us again this evening here on the mother of all talk shows to survey uh, the scene. Let's start uh, in Gaza, uh, Chris. We've both been across this course many times before, uh, but there's a particular frenzy and scale uh, to the current uh, slaughter, uh, even by comparison with previous ones, wouldn't you say? Yes, it really at this point rivals the massive ethnic cleansing campaigns of 1948 and 1949 when 750,000 Palestinians were pushed from their homes, a series of massacres, Daria Seen, hundreds of Palestinians killed, including many women and children. Again, a ma another massive ethnic cleansing campaign in 1967, when Israel seized what was left of independent Palestinian territory, about 22% of Palestinian land in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, uh, it rivals that in terms of its brutality. Uh, the noises out of Jerusalem on the part of the Netanyahu government, as well as the long calls for the removal of Palestinians, not only from uh, the West Bank and Gaza, but from inside Israel, the Palestinians with Israeli citizenship. Uh, that has been a uh, central tenant of many of the senior ministers in this far-right government, the most extreme government in Israel's history. Uh, the I don't think the word genocide at this point is inappropriate, uh, cutting off food, water, uh, uh, medicine, fuel. Uh, hospitals now are on the cusp of some have already shut down. Uh, I mean, this is just absolutely appalling. And of course, what's even more appalling is the complicity of the international community, or let's call the certainly Washington and Europe. Uh, Washington, as the Biden administration has vetoed, as you know, the uh, calls for ceasefire, even a pause uh, to get supplies in. Uh, it, it's really absolutely stunning. Uh, and I think it's clear that either all or part of the Gaza Strip will be bombed into rubble. Uh, the, the northern area, the area where 1.1 million Palestinians have had to evacuate is being uh, smashed, pounded day in and day out. I was in Sarajevo during the war. We were being hit with about three or 400 shells a day, uh, but the numbers of dead and wounded uh, were nothing, uh, such as we see in Gaza, hundreds, 500 a day, 700 a day, uh, and then thousands of wounded. Of course, we have to always Remember that half of the residents in Gaza, roughly 2.2, 2.3 million people, over half of them are children. So it's I, I'm I'm uh, like you, uh, you know, extremely upset as somebody who spent I spent seven years covering Gaza, months of my life in Gaza. But I'm also just it's jaw dropping on the part of Washington and European capitals as they sit there uh, and do nothing. Uh, in front of this slaughter. Indeed, if you try and speak out against it, you're censored. Uh, you're, you're, you're attacked as an anti-Semite. Uh, and I mean, we've gone from the absurdity of uh, criticizing Israel as a form of anti-Semitism to criticizing genocide as a form of anti-Semitism. We'll come to uh, the Western governments in a minute, but let's uh, try and drill down on the Netanyahu government itself and on the political situation in the country. Before this happened, uh, Netanyahu was in a considerable degree of trouble. Uh, there were mass demonstrations every Saturday night against uh, him. And almost all of the liberal chattering classes in the West were behind those demonstrations and calling for Netanyahu to, uh, to step down. And now, uh, with one uh, leap, uh, he's free uh, with uh, a blank check in his pocket uh, from uh, these uh, same Western governments that wanted rid of him just a few weeks ago. Uh, is 
this frenzy of violence uh, connected to the instability, insecurity uh, of the Netanyahu government? I would say it's connected to the incompetence of the Netanyahu government. Uh, remember, they moved significant numbers of troops over to the West Bank uh, to protect settlers uh, who were having, I think, a Purim festival or some kind of festival in the West Bank. So the, the whole border area along Gaza was unmanned, basically, by soldiers. It's why Hamas fighters so easily entered uh, military outposts all up and down uh, the security barrier that Israel uh, had built. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, a huge intelligence failure. So uh, they didn't even see it coming, this massive incursion. Uh, so I would say it's, it's rooted in the gross incompetence in, on the part of the Netanyahu government, who now is polling, by the way, at about 22 uh, percent. But the uh, attacks by the Hamas fighters have essentially given license. Now, every you mentioned the demonstrations against Netanyahu. It's important to remember that none of those protesters were calling for equal rights for Palestinians. The Palestinians had been completely erased from their consciousness. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, seven years in and out of Gaza, uh, it became apparent to all of us who were reporting that you can't, I mean, these people have been locked inside this concentration camp, let's call it for what it is, for 22 years. Many of those fighters who burst through those barriers had never been outside of Gaza their entire life. And you can't, and this was a theme that we kept reporting, although we were ignored, you can't brutalize these people week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out, and not expect uh, a response. I'm not defending it, uh, but, but we have to understand it. And to understand is not to condone. Uh, it was completely predictable, and, and this was Netanyahu's policy. After the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, we, Oslo is another issue, whether it would have worked or not. I knew Rabin, I covered him, actually, no Bibi. And, uh, uh, but, but there was an attempt on the part of Rabin and his government to reach some kind of accommodation through Oslo. With the removal of Rabin, and Bibi is a creation of the Israel lobby in the United States, funded massively by AIPAC. In fact, when he was running against Rabin, uh, all sorts of American campaign advisors were there uh, demonizing Rabin. Rabin at, at Bibi Netanyahu's rallies, Rabin was being uh, dressed up in effigy. There was an effigy of Rabin in a Nazi uniform. And then, of course, one of Bibi's followers assassinated Rabin. But at that point, it snuffed out any attempt at accommodation. And Bibi and the far right, their policy was grind them under their boot. So even when they had in the March of Return 2018, you had nonviolent Gandhian-like protests, people approaching the fence and being gunned down by Israeli snipers. And many of those who were targeted, as you know, were medics, uh, were press, uh, quite consciously. And I've been in a lot of war. You, when you look through a sniper scope, you can see the face of the person that you obliterate, which is why I don't buy in to now what Israel admits is the quote unquote accidental death of Shireen Abu Akhla from Al Jazeera. Uh, so this is a complete backfiring uh, or, or a complete collapse of the Netanyahu doctrine of crush them, uh, mow the lawn, as they say, periodically just bomb and shell Gaza. Remember, we're talking about attacking uh, a people in Gaza that has no army, no navy, no air force, no uh, artillery units, no mechanized units, no command and control. I really bristle at the idea of the word war. Uh, this isn't a war. This is indiscriminate slaughter. Uh, I am perfectly willing to condemn uh, Hamas's rockets, uh, Islamic uh, Palestine, Islamic Jihad, those rockets into Israel as a war crime because they're indiscriminate. I'm even willing to condemn the killing of civilians by Hamas as a war crime. But if you really want to get uh, cold-blooded and tally up the numbers, uh, the, uh, Israel's uh, killing f dwarfs anything that Hamas has been able to do, including, of course, this attack that left 1,400 Israelis dead. So, uh, you know, wh where is it going to go? I think that, uh, you know, there's a, there are reports that Israel will flood the tunnels rather than trying to fight within them. 
Uh, but that, of course, would kill all the hostages. Uh, but I wouldn't uh, exclude it as an Israeli policy. Uh, they, they have sacrificed throughout their history. Hostages, hostage takers in the past uh, have been slaughtered along with the hostages. Uh, there are some reports that out of the kibbutzim, uh, this may have been what happened, uh, that they in fact were not killed by Hamas, but they, the Israeli IDF went in there and obliterated these houses where Israelis were being held hostage. I don't know. I'm not on the ground. I'm not reporting it. Uh, but it certainly fits with my own coverage of Israel. And we have seen cases where Israeli soldiers have been seized by Hamas, taken into Gaza, and rather than rescue those soldiers, they just obliterate the entire spot, killing hundreds of people along with a soldier uh, where, where they're being held. Let's turn to these Western governments then. Uh, um, we, we, we know about war. We also know about politicians. Uh, politicians in countries that have elections uh, usually have to be sensitive to what appear to be uh, movements in public opinion. It uh, would seem to me uh, undeniable that in virtually all, if not all, uh, Western countries, uh, there has been a massive movement uh, of public sympathy for the Palestinian people, accentuated uh, rapidly over the last 17 days by uh, social media pictures and footage, uh, which... Uh, it's difficult to look at, especially for people like you and me who know uh, these families, who know these towns and villages. Uh, but uh, those who are looking at these pictures and videos are being moved. And you can see that. You can feel that. And yet your government and my government uh, are uh, absolutely ironclad, uh, side by side uh, with uh, Netanyahu. What's that all about? money. <laughs> They're bought off. Uh, you know, the Israel lobby and uh, Al Jazeera did a great series of, both on the UK and the US. The, the, it was an undercover reporter who reported that actually the UK investigation got aired. The, the Israel lobby blocked, Israel blocked the, the uh, broadcasting of the uh, investigation into the Israel lobby in the United States pirated versions were put up on electronic intifada and other sites and it's certainly worth watching because it just shows how captive the american political class is to the money uh, that is poured into their campaigns uh, and then also they will use those resources to take down candidates cynthia mckinney would be a good example that get up uh, and criticize israeli war crimes uh, Rashida Talid, who is of Palestinian descent, has been a target of the Israel lobby every time she runs. And, and we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. So these governments are not responsive in any way to public opinion. They're not responsive to international law. Uh, they're not responsive to genocide, this insane book that Samantha Power wrote, A Problem from Hell, where the U.S. suddenly is held up as the uh, country that should intervene, these humanitarian interventionists uh, who brought us the wars in the Middle East and brought us the war, the, you know, the breakdown of Libya and Syria and everywhere else, uh, and of course have fueled the insanity in the Ukraine, are completely silent now. I mean, and, and the genocidal campaign on the part of Israel is far greater uh, in terms of magnitude, daily magnitude, than anything the Russians have done uh, or anything that uh, any of these regimes, Gaddafi, I knew Gaddafi, I think you did too, any of these regimes in the Middle East did. So the hypocrisy is rank. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's the, I mean, the fundamental problem is the Palestinians don't have power and they're virtually friendless. And the Middle East regimes are very two-faced about their support for the Palestinian. It's skin deep. Uh, there's of course, strong resentment towards Israel and what it's doing as there should be. Uh, and that has seen uh, King Abdullah, who I also knew his father very well, went to school with King Abdullah. Uh, so uh, they have to respond. But these people are essentially lackeys of Western countries, in particular the United States. Uh, Jordan would be a good example of that. In Saudi Arabia, they'll make the right noises, but have long, uh, the, the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has long betrayed the Palestinians. Uh, so they're really friendless, powerless, and because of that, they are being slaughtered en masse 
in, and and have we're we're talking about no water, we're running out of water, uh, running out of uh, food, fuel. You can't uh, pump water. Uh, I mean, water's always been a problem, as you know, in Gaza even before, because the Israelis in both the West Bank and Gaza siphon off the aquifers. So. Uh, clean drinking water it was a huge issue even before this attack uh, and and uh, uh, th there's just there are very very few there may be volunteers from Iraq we hear and uh, they're the, the only real alliances they have are with Hezbollah um, on the northern border of uh, Israel and Lebanon and Iran and Syria but of course the, the, they talk about a wider war well that's already begun Israel has carried out two, two airstrikes against the uh, airports in uh, Damascus and Aleppo uh, in order to prevent su supplies, military supplies, getting to Hezbollah. Um, how far will this go? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, once you be open that Pandora's box of war, and I spent 20 years covering conflicts all over the globe, you don't control it. It controls you. Uh, so this could go horribly wrong in terms of a regional conflict. Uh, but I the myopia of the Netanyahu government. I mean, look, they're calling Palestinians Nazis. Uh, this is just utter insanity. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I don't see it. I mean, if the U.S. wants a pause on the invasion because they want to get their uh, air defense missile systems in place, uh, uh, fearing assaults, uh, quite correctly, there already have been assaults on American bases in Iraq and Syria. And that could become more serious. But this really could go, you know, if, if Israel starts striking deep within Lebanon, Lebanon has quite an arsenal of missiles that, I mean, let's be clear, these rockets from Palestinians are, they're kind of fireworks. I mean, they, they, uh, they're they lethal, but in a, to, to a very small degree, they're very inaccurate. Uh, but that's not true with the missile capability of Hezbollah that could really target infrastructure within Israel and cause quite a bit of damage. And then if that begins to happen, there's no telling. Remember, Israel is the one nuclear power within the Middle East. Do they drop a, uh, you know, some kind of nuclear device on Iran? I mean, none of that is out of the realm of possibility, given the, uh, you know, demented uh, figures within the Netanyahu cabinet who all come out of that old Kahana, Kahana, Mayor Kahana was a a far right rabbi. He was in Israel when I was there and uh, was actually banned because of his extremism. But these people are all the children of Kahana. Does, how does this all play into the election season in the United States? Uh, there's bipartisanship in your country and in mine. So no one party is going to take advantage. Uh, but my one candidate or other uh, break from the pack uh, and uh, and seek to uh, use the current real grave danger of a wider regional war with the American Navy right in the middle of it. I doubt it. I mean, you have read Bobby Kennedy. He's 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 uh, repeating every talking point of the far right. The only candidate uh, is my friend Cornell West, but you know he has no real traction, political traction. Uh, no, the, 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 it, and you have to look at the media coverage in the United States, which is slavishly pro-Israel and uh, gives voice to Israeli victims. I, I, as a reporter, those victims should be heard, but so should the Palestinian victims, uh, which uh, there's a kind of a very uh, marginal or superficial attempt to acknowledge a Palestinian voice so it's not uh, completely ignored and, and, and the, the bias is not completely exposed. Uh, but the 90 plus, 95 percent plus of the coverage is essentially Israeli propaganda and the two parties by the, the ruling class uh, the, the, within the two parties is essentially uh, completely backing up uh, the Israelis, in fact, doing their dirty work uh, to prevent a ceasefire. Well, that's the thing I find the most staggering, that the Biden administration, it ha which has the capacity to pressure Israel because we're a huge arms supporter, uh, $3 billion a year in arms, uh, and of course now more arms because the, the stocks of the Israelis are being depleted. It has the power to stop it, and it won't. 
uh, Ukraine, remember that? Uh, <laughs> the ease with which they have turned the page is, uh, is quite bewildering. I mean, uh, well, Ukraine feels like Ukraine a decade ago very well. instead Ukraine's of two weeks ago. Yeah, but Ukraine's a disaster. It is a complete disaster, as many of us who you know have covered war understood. It's a complete stalemate. Uh, it's just uh, you know what what's happening is the Ukrainian is you know uh, Ukrainians are essentially bleeding to death. Their country is being destroyed for. U.S. global interests, which is the isolation of Putin and and the de degradation or degrading the Russian army, but it's that was completely predictable. So yeah, of course they and, and you know even before October seventh, the coverage in the United States of Ukraine had significantly dropped off because it wasn't good news. Uh, it, without cheerleading for the valiant Ukrainians who were about to uh, you know push the Russian Empire back over the border, it didn't really work anymore given the facts on the ground, which even the media couldn't cover up.